We present The Ebb Tide by Robert Louis Stevenson, dramatized for radio by Jane Rogers. My title could justly be Murder or Be Murdered, for that is the stark fate awaiting our heroes at the end of a luckless and ill-managed voyage. When they land on that slave driver's hellish island, they meet a man of God who is closer to the devil than any you have ever met, but he comes later. Certainly, my title is apt for now. The ebb tide, as any sailor knows, leaves a man bound in shallows and in miseries. And indeed, when my story begins, these men were already the three most miserable English-speaking creatures in the whole of Tahiti. Each fully believed he could sink no lower the year was 1890, the hour late. Davis, a disgraced American sea captain, and Hewish, a thieving cockney, were listening to Robert Herrick relating his dream. One minute I was here, shivering on Papiti Beach at three in the morning. The next I was in Trafalgar Square at midday. <laughs> the roar of the strand and the roar of the reef were like the same. Hark to it now and you can hear the cabs and buses rolling. I felt like crying, or dancing, or jumping clean over Nelson's column. I was a fellow caught up out of hell and flung down into the dandiest part of hell. A squall burst in rain upon the outcasts, raging and lashing them until he panted for air and the world seemed whelmed in night and water. Huddled in one wet mass, they shivered and dozed till dawn. Then, cold at heart, their mouths sour from want of sleep, their steps rambling from lack of food, they strung like lame geese along the beach toward town. Schooner to port! Breakfast ahoy! Oh, smell that coffee and then fry bananas. I never tried this craft before. Curtain up. Watch this. <laughs> Give me some! Give me some! <laughs> See how his little feet came up! Like a dancing bear. Is it possible to die of shame? Oh, who cares about your shame, Eric? He's got the crew's attention. Hello, you fellas! No eat, no dance, savvy? With unsightly greed, the trio glutted themselves on the hot food and coffee. Thanks for breakfast, you fellows. You're gentlemen. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I can't stand it. Oh, what can't Mr. Eric stand? Hasn't he had a meal? I'm licking my lips. I can't beg. See here, Herrick. You ain't the only one had pride. If you had commanded the finest bark that ever sailed from Portland... Ah, yeah. What happened? I were drunk in my berths when she struck the breakers in 14 Island Group and had the wit to stay there and drown. What did you do? came on deck and gave drunken orders uh -huh. and lost six lives. Six dead? Murdered by me. For the way I lost that ship, I might as well have bored a hole in her side with an auger. Hope she was insured, Captain. That's where my pride got me. I never dared go home again. And the wife and little ones went to England to her father's place. And I don't know what's come to them. Oh, Captain, forgive me. I'm sorry. Oh, play your violins. As the heat of the day increased, our three friends sprawled in the shade of the old calaboose to watch the townsfolk and the aimless hours drag by. At length, the captain roused himself and set off in the direction of the British consulate. Hewish fell asleep and Herrick paced the old prison cell, sometimes pausing to cool his face in the bucket of tepid water. Approach the beer, boys. Glory hallelujah. Beer, Captain? Beer and plenty of it, boys. Oh, pass it here. Oh. Where'd you get this? You, Hoosh, take your bottle and go see how the wind is down on the beach. I'll call you when you're wanted. Secrets? That ain't the ticket. Look here, my son. This is business savvy. Oh, go on then. Jaw till you're blue in the face. I don't think it's the friendly touch, that's all. What is it? Eric, I got a ship. A ship? What ship? That schooner with the hospital flag. 
She's the Farallone, 160-ton register out of Frisco for Sydney, in California Champagne. Captain, mate, and one hand all died of smallpox, same as they had round of the Pomatus. Consul tried Captain McNeil, scared of smallpox. He tried Caparati, that Corsican, and Le Bleu. Wouldn't lay a hand on it. All too fond of their sweet lives. Last of all, when there wasn't nobody left to offer it to, he offers it to me. Davis, will you ship Captain and take her to Sydney, says he? So, Eric, I'll ship you mate at $75 and two months advance. Me? Mate? Why, I'm a landsman. Guess you gotta learn. I've been shipmates with worse. Oh, God knows I can't refuse, Captain. That ain't all. What else is there? I plan to steal the Farallone. <laughs> See here. Think of the cargo. Oh. Champagne. In Peru, we can sell that liquor off the pier head and the schooner after it if we find a fool to buy her. Herrick was obliged to join in the captain's plan, and Hewish naturally jumped at it. Soon enough, the three of them were set up on the far alone. Stores were loaded, the smallpox-infected bedclothes were tumbled overboard, and the Kanaka crew mustered for their watches. The rudder was turned hard port, and the cheerfully clanking windlass brought the anchor home. After our grub, I'll show you the log, Harry. What's this? Where did that come from, Hoosh? It's fizz. And it came from the after old captain. This'll never do. It's our cargo. You babies. I'd to go on deck and steer while you two sit and guzzle. I have to call you sir and mister. I'll have fees, ad lib, or it won't wash. I'd give fifty dollars this had never happened. Well, it has happened, you see. <laughs> Try some. It's devilish good. No. <laughs> oh, there's no denying it's genuine stuff. Now, Hush, you clear out and take your wheel. Aye, aye, sir. Herrick, you look sick, old man. You know, I am a queer kind of a first officer, Captain. Shucks. You only got to mind the ship's course and keep your slate to half a point. Well, a babby could do it, let alone a college graduate like you. All clear, forward. All clear, Captain. Hold a lee. Haul in your slack as she comes. Put your back into it, Hoosh. Keep your feet out of the coils. All right. Keep your hair on. Look lively. Move, by God. <laughs> What? You pick yourself up and keep the wheel hard over, you wooden fool. Did you want to get killed? Draw the jib. Do you know you just struck me? Do you know I saved your life? Where would you have been if that boom had swung out and you bundled in the slack? Ports are full of main sheet men. They hop upon one leg, what's left of them, and the rest are dead. Well, there may be something in that. I'll have a drink to it. <sighs> What's wrong with Hooish? Is he on the champagne again? That's a nasty little beast. That's a biter. Oh, must I take the wheel? By the wind. When you get a heavy puff, steal all you can to windward, but keep her a good full. The schooner steered very easy, and Herrick, watching the moon-whitened sails, was overpowered by drowsiness. But a third pop of a cork startled him. And then he heard the captain singing. Swing low, sweet chariot, <laughs> coming for to carry me home. Swing. This drunken evening set the model for those that were to follow. Two cases of champagne scarce lasted four and twenty hours, and the whole was drunk by Hewish and the captain. The captain lay sprawled all day upon the lockers, tippling and reading novels. Herrick burned with rage and resolution. Rage against his comrades. Resolution to carry through this business if it might be carried. And then the ship was becalmed. All hands on deck! Look lively! Set the mensal! And you, ugly mug, the jib topsail! What? 
You sluggards asleep? You brute. Look behind you. What's that? What did you say, Herrick? A squall, Captain. A roaring black squall racing to catch us. You what? Behind. You lost the Sea Ranger because you were a drunken sot. And now you're going to lose the fire alone, and your daughter shall walk the streets. My God. Herrick. Look! Look! Here it comes! Down the mainsail! Jim Topsail! Hey! Let the staysail be! Get a knife to the fore sheets! She's going over! She's going over! Hold back, boys! Hold her back! Hold her back! She's up! Secure the foresail boom! Two hands to the bomb! I have to tell you, Captain, that I resign my position as mate. I suggest you put Mr. Hewish in my place. He will make a worthy first officer to your captain, sir. Don't you be too quick with me, Mr. Herrick. There ain't nothing wrong but the drink. Let me get sober once, and then you'll see... What do you mean there shall be no more drinking? Neither by you nor Hewish? And that you'll bear your proper share of the ship's work instead of leaving it all to a landsman? If it is, be so good as to say categorically. You put things in a hard way for a gentleman to swallow. Fail me again. I'll do the square thing. And here's my hand on it, Herrick. You know what you said about my daughter? I want to tell you why it hit me so hard. She... She's dead, you see. Why, Davis, you've told me a dozen times she was alive. Clear your head, man. No, sir. She's dead died of a bowel complaint. She lies in Portland, Maine. Davis, I... So you see, she can't walk no streets. <laughs> Here's a new bottle for you. No more of that, Hewish. Oh, turn teetotal, have you? About time, eh? Believe me, nearly lost another ship, I fancy. Do you hear me speak? Oh, suppose I do. You speak loud enough, Captain. Let him free now. Uh, We've had enough trouble today. Uh, it's his last. <sighs> this is a bad bottle. <laughs> it's water! Let me taste. Uh, mm. uh, uh, open another. Here. Crocky! Here. Let's sample the hold. <sighs> Water. Water. The bottles down at the back aren't even wired. There's not any pretense of fraud. You've only got two crates of the proper stuff left. Leaving the crew to clear up, the three adventurers slumped at the three sides of the fixed table in the deckhouse. All memory of their differences was swept away by the presence of the common ruin. Davis was first to rally. The old game was a risky game, but here's a new game, safe as running a Vienna bakery. We just put this farallone before the wind and run till we're reasonably well up with some other place, say Samoa, where they have an American consul. Down goes the farallone, a good riddance to her. Yeah. We'll torture, she'll go up like paper. A day or so in the boat, the consul packs us home at Uncle Sam's expense to Frisco. And the insurance pays up. Samoa, it'll take us forever to get there. Ah, with a fair wind, Herrick? Say, beg your pardon, Herrick, but did you keep the run of the stores? Had I been told to do so, it should have been done. As it was, the cook helped himself to what he pleased. Yeah, I drew it rather fine, you see. The great thing was to be clear out of a PD before the consul could think better of it. Tell you what, <coughs> guess I'll take stock. Hmm. There's another screw loose. My man, it is still your watch on deck. And surely your wheel also. Oh, you come the heavy swell, don't you, ducky? Stand away from that binnacle. Surely your wheel, my man. Yeah. You wait till I interview that cook. The fault is yours, Davis, and you know it. <laughs> You're a plummy captain, ain't you? How often have I heard you send the old blooming dinner off and tell the man to chuck it in the swill tub? And breakfast? Oh, my crikey. Breakfast for ten, and you all are in for more. That will do, Hewish. Oh, so you take his part, do you? You stuck-up, sneering snob. Land ho! Land? What's this? There ain't no land here. But land it was. An island. The beach excellently white. The barrier of trees inimitably green. 
there was neither house nor man nor the smoke of fire. At the mouth of the lagoon, the sea turned and swept eddying in, and the schooner was carried on the influx like a toy. At the far end, tucked behind a tall grove of trees, appeared suddenly a line of sheds, a mansion, and a huddle of native huts clustered round a tower with a belfry. The place breathed a sense of desertion that was almost poignant. As they approached to berth, a boat suddenly appeared from a hidden creek, manned by two native oarsmen and bearing a passenger in full white tropical dress. As the boat drew near, our heroes observed him to be a huge, dangerous-looking fellow. His manners and movements, like fire and flint, betrayed his European ancestry. You bring news of my ship, the Trinity Hall? No, sir. Ah, then there's some small mistake, no doubt. And I must ask you to what I'm indebted for this pleasure. Well, I suppose you may call it an accident. Hope we don't intrude. <laughs> In point of fact, you do. But, Captain, it may suit me you're coming here. My own schooner's overdue. Are you open to a charter? I guess so. My name's Atwater. I presume you are the captain? Yes, sir. Captain Davis. Well, see here. Better begin fair. He's skipper on deck right enough, but not below. Below, we're all equal. When it comes to business, I'm as good as he. Who is your man? Let's go into the house and talk it over among pals. We've some prime fizz. My name is Herrick. Since introductions are going, we shall be very glad if you will step inside. Oh. University man? Yes. Merton. I'm of the other lot. Trinity Hall, Cambridge. I called my schooner after the old shop. This is queer company for us to meet in, Mr. Herrick. Do you bear out Mr. Wish's description of your vintage? Or was that the unaffected poetry of his own nature bubbling up? I don't know. It's only California. It's good enough, I believe. Well, then, I'll tell you what. You three gentlemen come ashore this evening and bring a basket of wine with you. I'll try and find the food. Oh. By the way, have you had smallpox? Personally, no. But the schooner had it. Deaths? Two. Had you any deaths here on the island? Twenty-nine out of thirty-three souls upon the island. Oh. So that's why everything's deserted. That is why, Mr. Wish. The settlement is empty and the graveyard full. Twenty-nine out of thirty-three? Why, when it came to burying... Or did you bother Barry? There was one day at least when we gave up, with five dead and thirteen dying. We disposed of them in the lagoon. So, you'll come to dinner then. Shall we say half past six? So good of you. I'm sure we shall be very glad, Mr. Atwater. Yes, Mr. Wish and Captain Davis at 6.30. And you, Herrick, at four sharp. You are talking of a charter. Was I, Captain? Your own, Mr. Atwater. Your own schooner is overdue. Indeed. Thirty-three days overdue at noon today. She comes and goes, eh? Plies between here and... Exactly. Every four months, three trips a year. You go in her ever? No. One stops here. One has plenty to attend to. Stop here, do you? How long? Ten years. But it does not seem so. I dare say not in as snug a berth as this. Well, the spot, as you are good enough to indicate, Captain Davis, is not entirely intolerable. Shell, I suppose. Yes, there is shell. And this is a considerable big beast of a lagoon, sir. Is there, uh, is the fishing, would you call the fishing, anyways good? I don't know that I would call it anyways anything, if you put it to me direct. There are pearls, too. Pearls, too. Well, I give out. <laughs> if you're not going to tell, you're not going to tell. Well, there can be no reason why I should affect the least degree of secrecy about my island. The point on which we are now differing, if you can call it a difference, is one of times and seasons. I have some information which you think I might impart, and I think not. Well, we'll see tonight. So, Eric. What do you think of Mr. Atwater? I don't know. I am attracted and repelled. He was insufferably rude to you. 
And you, Hewish? Mm, don't ask me what I think of him. There's a day coming, I pray God, when I can tell it in myself. Hewish means the same as what I do. When that man came stepping around and saying, Look here, I'm at water. I sized him right straight up. Here's the real article, I said, and I don't like it. Here's the real first-rate copper-bottomed aristocrat. So what's he stopping here ten years for? Pearls. Because they're too valuable to trust out of his own sight, and pearls want a lot of handling and matching. The man who sells his pearls as they come in, one here, two there, well, that man's a fool. And it's not. Atwater. Well, suppose that's so, and he has these pearls, a ten years collection, suppose he has. Davis? I'll tell you, Eric, that fellow's your kind. He's not ours. He took to you, and he's wiped his boots on me and Hewish. Save him if you can. Save him? You go ashore and talk him smooth. And if you get him and his pearls aboard, I'll spare him. If you don't... There's gonna be a funeral. Does that suit you, Hewish? Mm. I ain't a forgiving man, but I'm not the sort to spoil business, neither. And if I can't? You talk to me as if I was God Almighty to do this and that. He's not alone. There's the two natives who rode his boat and one other. Only four alive on that island. I should say we'd be a match for them. But if I can't... My son, you better do your level best or you'll see sights. Oh, yes. Oh, crikey, yes. Ikey, pikey, crikey, fikey, chilling your wallabies already. <laughs> In the brazen heat of the afternoon, Herrick went unwillingly up the pier and into the shadow of a colonnade of palms. The buildings of the settlement showed here and there through the stems, fresh painted and all silent as the grave. Now he passed storehouses, one piled high with pearl shell, the next with random ship's lumber. In the third was diving apparatus, neatly ordered, pumps and pipes and leaded boots and ten huge snouted helmets shining in rows. Welcome, Mr. Herrick. Ah, the diving helmets. The eastern half of my lagoon is shallow, so my people were able to get in the diving dress to great advantage. It paid beyond belief. It was a queer sight when they were at it. And these faceless marine monsters kept appearing and reappearing in the midst of the lagoon. Fond of parables? I am, Mr. Atwater. Well, I saw these costumes come up dripping and go down again. And come up dripping and go down again. And all the while the fellow inside is dry as toast. And I thought we all wanted a diving dress to go down into the world in and come up scatheless. What do you think the name of it was? Self-conceited? <laughs> well, I mean, seriously. <laughs> Call it self-respect, then. And why not grace? Why not God's grace, Herrick? Why not the grace of your maker and redeemer? He who died for you. He who upholds you. He whom you daily crucify afresh. I beg your pardon. I see you don't believe in God. Not in your sense, I'm afraid. I never argue with atheists. Let's go across the island to the outer beach. So what brought you to the South Seas, Atwater? Youth, curiosity, love of the sea, and an interest in missions. And you found this island by accident? As you did. And since then, I have had a business and a colony and a mission of my own. I made my mission pay. No good ever came of coddling. I gave these beggars what they wanted. A judge in Israel, the bearer of the sword and scourge. I was making a new people here. And behold, the angel of the Lord smote them, and they were not. Your graveyard. The rude forefathers of the hamlet lie. Coral to coral, pebbles to pebbles. This has been the main scene of my activity in the South Pacific. Well, you loved these people? <laughs> oh dear, no. Oh, don't think me a philanthropist. I dislike men, and I hate women. Here was one I liked, though. 
He was a fine, savage fellow. He had a dark soul. I'm fanciful. I take fads. I like you. No one can like me. Oh, you're wrong there. You're attractive. Very attractive. No one can like me if you knew how I despise myself and why. I saw the blood come into your face today when you remembered Oxford, and I could have blushed for you myself. To see a gentleman with these two vulgar wolves. Wolves? Vulgar wolves. Do you know that today, when I came on board, I trembled? Well, you concealed it well. No, I was afraid for all that. I was afraid of those two wolves. And now, Herrick, you poor lost puppy, what do you do with these two wolves? I... I don't do anything. There is nothing wrong. All is above board. Captain Davis is a good soul. He's a... he's a family man. And a very nice man. And so is Mr. Wish, no doubt. I won't go so far as that. I do not like Hewish, and yet... Well, he has his merits, too. In short, as good a ship's company as one would ask. Yes, quite. So then we approach the other point, of why you despise yourself. Oh, do we not all despise ourselves? Oh, I say I do. But do I? I never gave a groan like yours. Herrick, it came from a bad conscience. Ah, oh, man. That poor diving dress of self-conceit is sadly tattered. Today, if you will hear my voice, here in this burying place of brown innocence, fall on your knees and cast your sins and sorrows on the Redeemer. For God's sake, can't you see I'm on the rack? I know it. And my fingers are on the screws. Please, God, I will bring a penitent this night before his throne. Come, come to the mercy seat. At water, you push me beyond bearing. I do not believe. It is living truth to you, to me, folklore. I do not believe there is any form of words under heaven by which I can lift the burden from my shoulders. I cannot, cannot, cannot. And let that suffice. Your loss, old man. Shall we go back to the house? Our guests will soon be due. As they walked down the darkened colonnade of palms, the fact of Herrick's errand on the island slowly swung clear in front of him, like the moon out of clouds. He must lure Atwater on board, and he was failing. The three lives went up and down before him like buckets in a well. Atwater intrigued, dazzled and revolted him. But the vision of him lying murdered was pure nightmare. And Davis, with his coarse-grained, oat-bred commonness of nature and the sudden shining forth of a tenderness that lay too deep for tears, his little daughter, no, Herrick could not betray Davis. Even Hewish, through their cohabitation on the schooner, had earned some loyalty to which Herrick must be true or be totally dishonoured. Horror of sudden death for horror of sudden death it must be Atwater. But how? Herrick observed again Atwater's huge frame and muscled shoulders as he opened the door to a scullery at the back of his house. Yes, the evenings here would be very pleasant if one had anything to do. By day, of course, one can shoot. You shoot? Yes. I am what you would call a fine shot. It is faith. I believe my aim is true. If I were to miss once, well, it would spoil me for months. You never miss, then? Not unless I mean to. Come and wash your hands. What's that box? My safe. With ten years' accumulation of pearls from the lagoon where I have had as many as ten divers going all day long. Would you like to see them? Oh, no. No, thank you. I, uh, I do not care for pearls. I believe you ought to cast an eye on my collection, which is really unique, and which, oh, it is the case with all of us, hangs by a hair. Today it is here and together in this safe. Tomorrow... Tonight, it may be scattered. Thou fool, 
This night thy soul shall be required of thee. I do not understand you. Not? You, you seem to speak in riddles. I am a fatalist. And just now an experimentalist. With my fellow men, you understand. Well, shall we step on the veranda? I have a dry sherry that I would like your opinion of. You go always armed? Always. I have been through a mutiny here. That was one of the incidents of my missionary life. The island dinner was remarkable for its variety and excellence. Turtle soup, fish, fowls, a sucking pig, a coconut salad. Sherry, hawk and claret succeeded each other, followed by the Farlone champagne, all served by Atwater's silent and attentive servants, the same who had rowed his boat. Atwater appeared at his ease. A huge cat sat on his shoulder purring and occasionally, with a deft paw, capturing a morsel in the air. To a cat, he might be likened himself as he lolled at the head of his table, dealing out attentions and innuendos and using the velvet and the claw indifferently. Hewish and the captain fell under the charm of his hospitality. Herrick ate and drank without tasting, his mind occupied by the horror of the circumstances in which he sat. Well now, that water... You have everything about you in no end style. But I tell you, it wouldn't do for me. Too much of the old rustic bridge by the mill. Too retired by half. <laughs> Give me the sound of the bow bells. You must not think it was always so, Mr Wish. This was once a busy shore. A glass of brown mouton, sir. Mm. Bring the wine. <coughs> Oof, they say so. You should pay for that. Where do you get your labour from, anyway? Where not? As we could name no destination, we had to take the Trinity Hall far and wide to get them. Pity my business partner isn't here. He is full of yarns. That was his part, to collect them. Then began mine, which was to educate. You mean to run them? I, Captain, to run them. Do you mean to say you did it single-handed? Oh, one did it single-handed because there was nobody to help one. By God, but you must be a holy terror. One does one's best. I've seen a lot of slave driving in my time. I've been counted a good driver myself. But put me down on this blame beach alone with nothing but a whip and a mouthful of bad words and ask me to drive them? No, sir. Well, one way or another, one got it knocked into their heads that they must work. And they did. Until the Lord took them... I hope he made them jump. When it was necessary, Mr. Wish, I made them jump. Did you... did you ever have crime here? Yes, Herrick, we did. Then how did you handle that, sir? Well, it was a queer case. I dare say you know two types of natives, which may be called the obsequious and the sullen. Obsequiousness ran out of the first like wine out of a bottle. Sullenness congested in the second. But Sullins was industrious and ungraciously obedient. Now Sullins got into trouble and he was punished accordingly, without effect. So the next day and the next, till I began to be weary of the business and Sullins, I'm afraid, particularly so. There came a day when he was in fault again for perhaps the thirtieth time. The thirtieth? Indeed. And he rolled a dull eye upon me with a spark in it and appeared to speak. Now, the regulations of the place are formal upon one point. We allow no explanations. So one stopped him instantly. The next day he was gone. There could be nothing more annoying. If the labour took to running away, and there are sixty miles of this island, the fishery was wrecked. Two days later it came upon me with a flash that Sullins had been innocent and the real culprit throughout had been obsequiousness. I set off to look for Sullins. About 200 yards up the island, he was hanging in a coca palm. His tongue was out, poor devil, and the birds had got at him. Oh, he took his own life. Next day I had the conch sounded and all hands out before sunrise. One took one's gun and led the way with obsequiousness. Presently... The hanged man came into sight. They all burst out lamenting for their comrade, 
and obsequiousness was the loudest of the mourners. One told him to go up the tree. He had a rather sickly smile, but went. So soon as he was up, he looked down, and there was the rifle covering him. He gave a whimper like a dog. You could hear a pin drop. No more keening now. There they all crouched upon the ground. There was he in the treetop. The colour of lead. And between was the dead man dancing a bit in the air. And then? Shot. They came to ground together. It was murder. A cold-hearted, bloody-minded murder, you monster. Hey, behave yourself. Murderer. Don't be a damn fool. Murderer and a hypocrite. Your friend appears overexcited. Uh, it must be the wine. I think I'll take him out. I'll walk. I'll sober him up, I guess. The captain walked Herrick down to the pier, soothing and remonstrating in his comfortable voice. The lagoon broke at their feet with a sound as delicate as a whisper, and stars of all degrees looked down on their own images in that vast mirror. The more angry colour of the Farallone's rigging lamp burned in the middle distance. Let's up anchor, Captain, and to sea. Where to, my to son? To sea, to the sea, away from this dreadful island and that sinister man. It can't be, Herrick. No ship of mine puts to sea without provisions. You don't seem to understand. The whole thing is over. That man with the cat knows all. Say, Herrick, you didn't give us away. <laughs> give you away? What was there to give away? We're transparent. We've got Rascal branded on us. The two wolves, he calls you and Hewish. What is the puppy doing with the two wolves, he asked. He showed me his pearls. He said they might be dispersed before morning and all hung by a hair and smiled as he said it. He looks at us and laughs like God. The pearls, he showed them to you. Well, the safe they were in, but you'll never get them. Do you think he would have been so easy at table unless he was prepared? The servants were both armed. He was armed himself, he told me. Why? Why did he tell you all this? <laughs> He's a fatalist. What's that, a fatalist? A fellow that believes his bullets go true, believes it all falls out as God chooses. Do as you like to prevent it. Why, I guess I believe right so myself. <laughs> well, you must be a fool. Well, there's one thing sure, I must get Hewish out of that. He's not fit to hold his end up with a man like you describe. No, Davis, don't do it. L leave it alone, for God's sake, for your children's sake. But the captain was hurrying back to Atwater's house, his thoughts racing. The man had mocked them from the beginning. He would teach him to make a mockery of John Davis. Herrick thought him a god, but give him a second to aim in, and the god was overthrown. He felt for the butt of his revolver and considered how to do it. From behind? It was difficult to get there. From across the table? No, the captain preferred to shoot standing, so as you could be sure to get your hand upon your gun. The best would be to summon Hewish, and when Atwater stood and turned, ah, then would be the moment. Wrapped in this ardent prefiguration of events, the captain sped towards the house with his head down. Hands up! Halt! What? How the hell did he... The surprise was complete. Davis had walked into an ambush. Atwater leant on a post of the veranda, covering him with a Winchester. He was flanked by one of the servants, similarly armed. The other servant supported Hewish, who was grinning senselessly at the top of the stair. At a word from Atwater, he thrust Hewish down, and that gentleman bounded forth into space, struck the earth, ricocheted, and brought up with his arms about a palm. His mind was quite a stranger to these events. He clung to the tree like an infant, and seemed by his dips to suppose himself engaged in the pastime of bobbing for apples. There is your drunken Whitechapel carrion. And now you might very well ask why I do not put an end to you at once, as you deserve. If you think you have the right I'll to... I'll tell you why, Davis. It is because I have nothing to do with a sea ranger and the people you drowned. Or the far alone and the champagne that you stole. That is your account with God. He will settle it when the clock strikes. But understand... If I ever see any of you again, you shall eat a bullet. And now take yourself off. March! The devil. Hewish. Hewish, come on. 
guys lost my scum right along here. Mm. It's all right. I'll sleep here without you. If uh, you don't come and come now by the living God, I'll shoot you. I'll walk straight. Or I'll know why not. Eric, get up, man. The boat's coming for us. Is Hewish dead? No, he's not dead. And that water? Now you just shut your head. I'll stand no more of your drivel. They waited in silence till the boat bumped on the pier, then raised Hewish head and heels and flung him in the bottom. The captain paced the waist with brief irate turns and Herrick stood leaning his arms on the taffrail. The crew had all turned in. On shore through the colonnade of palm stems, Atwater's house was to be seen shining steadily with many lamps and there was nothing else visible whether in heaven above or in the lagoon below, but the stars and their reflections. It might have been minutes, or it might have been hours, that Herrick leaned there, looking in the glorified water and drinking peace. A bath of stars, he was thinking. At last, he stepped forward to where the boat rocked alongside and ground occasionally against the schooner. He looked about him. No eye must see him in this last act. He slid silently into the boat, thence silently into the starry water. Instinctively, he swam a little. It would be time enough to stop by and by. The events of the ignoble day passed before him, and he thanked heaven for that open door of suicide. In such a little while, he would be done with it. The random business at an end. The prodigal son come home. Why should he delay? Here, where he was now, let him drop the curtain. It was easy to stop swimming, if he could do it. Could he? He could not. He was aware instantly of an opposition in his limbs, clinging to life with a single and fixed resolve, finger by finger, sinew by sinew. There was no escape. The open door was closed in his recreant face. For perhaps a minute there raged in his mind the coil of this discovery. Then cheerless certainty followed, and he turned and struck out for shore. About three in the morning he came to shore upon the beach in front of Atwaters. There he sat and looked forth into a world without any of the lights of hope. The poor diving dress of self-conceit was sadly tattered indeed. Dawn began to break over the far side of the atoll. The clouds became dyed with gorgeous colours. The shadow of the night lifted. And what brings you here, Mr Herrick? Slowly now, I have you covered. Well, why don't you fire? In my own good time. What brings you here? I don't know. You're wet. Yes, I am wet. Can you do anything with me? Hmm. Would depend a good deal upon what you are. What am I? I'm a coward. There's very little to be done with that. And yet the description hardly strikes one as exhaustive. <sighs> oh, what is the matter? I am broken crockery. The whole of my life is gone to water. I, I have nothing left that I believe in except my living horror of myself. I don't know why I come to you. I hate you. Oh, but you are a gentleman. I put myself helpless in your hands. If I can't do anything, be merciful and put a bullet through me. As you would a puppy with a broken leg. If I were you, I'd come up to the house and put on some dry clothes. Oh, Lord, I've an headache on me. I believe I was a bit swipey last night, Captain. Where's that crybaby Eric? Gone. For sure? Oh, I say, I'd have gone too. You would, would you, Ewish? Mm, yes, I would. I like that water. 
He's all right. And ain't he sherry in it, brother? I wish I had a dram of it now. Well, you never get no more of it, that's one thing. <sighs> What's wrong with you, Davis? Coppers, I... I ain't grumpy. I'm playful as a canary bird, I am. Yes, you're playful, I own that. And you were playful last night in a damn fine performance you made of it. Hello? How's this? What performance? Well, I'll tell you. And he did. At length. With every absurd detail emphasized. He had his own vanity and hewishes upon the grill and roasted them, inflicting and enduring agonies of humiliation. It was a plain man's masterpiece of the sardonic. What's your idea? You give me your hand across the table and say, God strike me dead if I don't back you up. What for? Luck. God strike me dead if I don't back you up. But I don't see what... Well, give me time. The first point is that we can't get ashore. But how about a flag of truce? Wouldn't that do the trick? It might. Your next point is to get near him. I'm going to have you write a letter in which you say you're ashamed to meet his eye and that the bearer, Mr J.L. Huish, is empowered to represent you. Why? Well, you're big. He knows you have a gun and anybody can see you ain't a man to hesitate about using it. But he won't be afraid of me. I'm such a little un. And I'll hold my hands up. Right enough, see? No, I don't see. What do you mean? I mean to do for the beast. He's had his larks out of me. I'm going to have my lark out of him. He'll have a dose of my medicine. What is it? <laughs> you sure you want to know? Yes, I want to know. Yeah. But it's just a tiny bottle. This is vitriol, this is. No. This'll burn to the bone. You'll see it smoke upon him like hellfire. No, no, by God. Now, see here, ducky. This is my bean feast, I believe. I'm going up to that man, single-handed I am. He's about seven foot high, and I'm five foot one. This is David and Goliath, I tell you. First thing you know, you'll see him running around and howling like a good enough. Don't, don't talk of it. What did you want? You wanted to kill him, and try to last night. Here I'll show you how, and because there's some medicine in a bottle, you kick up this fuss. It's too damn hateful, isn't there no other way? Murder ain't Jane Teal. It ain't easy, it ain't safe, and it takes a man to do it. He's the man. Hewish, I... Well, out with it. Have you anything else to put up? Is there any other chance to try? No, it can't be. It's too much. It's damnation. God would never forgive it. Well, and who wants him to? You were damned years ago for the Sea Ranger, and said so yourself. Now, be damned for something else, and hold your tongue. No, old man, don't do it. Oh, I'm gonna see that man, and chuck this vitriol in his eyes. If you stay here, I'll go alone. Have it your own way. Now, give me over your pistol. I have to see all clear. Six shots for the servants, and Eric. And mind you, don't waste them. It was close on noon. There was no breath of wind and the heat was scarce bearable when the two men climbed down to the boat. A white shirt at the end of an oar served as flag of truce. On the face of the lagoon, blinding copper suns danced and stabbed them in the eyeballs. Davis's horror of the medicine in the bottle went beyond him, and he seemed to himself to be parting the last strands that united him to God. Oh, golly, but he's hot. Cruel lot, I call it. <laughs> It must feel awfully peculiar to get bowled out on a day like this. I'd rather have it on a cold and frosty morning, wouldn't you? <laughs> Here we go round the mulberry bush on a cold and frosty morning. Oh, dry up. Oh, we may both be bowled over, one up, t'other down, within the next ten minutes. You hear, Gould? You're going to see a rum start presently, I promise you that. I'll have no blasphemy, no blasphemy in my boat. All right, Cap. Anything to oblige? Hello. Here they are. Now or never. Is he going to shoot? What's that? What's what? Faceless demon staring at us. Oh, diver's helmets, you ninny. Can't you see? Oh, so they are. Oh, I see. It's for armor. Yeah, lucky he's only put them on his servants. It'd muck up our little party if he was wearing one himself. Gently does it. I'll tie her up. 
metals blazing like hellfire, like their heads are ablaze. What do you want? I'll tell that to Atwater. I don't tell you, because you played the truckling sneak. Here's a letter for him. Take it and give it and be hanged to you. David, is this right? Well, I'll give the letter. Shall I bring the answer? And don't move off this pier. I have deputed my friend and partner, Mr. J.L. Hewish, to lay before you my proposals, which by their moderation will, I trust, be found to merit your attention. Mr. Hewish is entirely unarmed. What does this writing mean, Herrick? Treachery? Uh, I suppose so. Well, tell Hewish to come on. One isn't a fatalist for nothing. You are to come along, Hewish. He bids you look out. No tricks. Where is he? Good. He stands out. In front of you, in the shade of the grove. Not you, Davis. Put your back to that figurehead, do you hear me? And stand fast. That will do, Mr. Wish. From that distance and keeping your hands up like a good boy, you can put me in possession of the skipper's views. Too damn far. Mr. Hatwater, I don't know if you ever had a mother. I can set your mind at rest. I had, and henceforth her name need not recur in our communication. I am sorry, sir, if I have seemed to trespass on your private feelings. I know a gentleman when I see him, and as such, I have no hesitation in throwing myself on your merciful consideration. It is hard lines to have to own yourself beat. It's hard lines to have to come and beg to you for charity. When if things had only gone right, the whole place was as good as your own. <laughs> I can understand the feeling. You are judging me, Mr Atwater, and God knows how unjustly. Thou gold ceased me, was the text I had in my Bible, which my father, he... I beg your pardon once more, but do you know... You seem to me to be a trifle nearer, which is entirely outside of our bargain. Sir, I'm out of hearing. Let me come a little nearer to... You oblige me to raise my rifle, sir. I would venture to suggest that you take one, two, three steps back and stay there. Aye, but Mr Atwater, a defenceless fellow such as yours truly... Kindly oblige me by opening your hands. Let me see your fingers spread, you dog! Throw down the thing you're holding! At almost the same moment, the indomitable Hewish decided to throw, and Atwater pulled the trigger. The bottle had not yet left the clerk's hand before the bullet shattered both. For the twinkling of an eye, the wretch was in hell's agony, bathed in liquid flames, a screaming bedlamite, and then a second and more merciful bullet stretched him dead. The whole thing was come and gone in a breath. Before Herrick could turn about, before Davis could complete his cry of horror, Hewish lay in the sand, sprawling and convulsed. Davis, I give you 60 seconds to make your peace with God. I guess I'll not trouble the old man, considering the job I was on. I guess it's better business to just shut my face. Atwater smiled a cruel smile. His first shot grazed the captain's hat. His second whistled past his cheek. His third nicked an earlobe. Herrick crouched behind a palm like a child, his hands over his eyes. Steady! I'll take your 60 seconds. Good! My God. Look after my two kids. I... I... For Christ's sake. Amen. But don't keep fooling with me long. That's all your prayer? Yeah, I guess so. No, don't put your rifle down. So is that done? Is your peace made with heaven? Because it is with me. Go. And sin no more, sinful father. And remember that whatever you do to others... God shall visit it again a thousandfold upon your innocent offspring. 
Isn't there no mercy? Oh, what must I do to be saved? Ah, here. Here is the true penitent. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is A fortnight is later, heaven. on a hot, blustery day, Give with the trade running very boisterous through the palm, so they crashed and whistled Forgive in its gusts, Herrick tacked out to the far alone. The schooner was rocking at anchor some two miles to windward. Alone he boarded, bearing a can of kerosene, and passed from house to forecastle to main hatch, each visit followed by a coil of smoke. As he climbed down and shoved off, flames broke forth on the schooner. And soon, the far alone was wrapped to the topmasts in leaping arms of fire. At the landing pier, her Kanarka crew, now Mr Atwater's new slaves, paused in their unloading of stores from the Trinity Hall. Their dull eyes reflected the blazing fire. Keep moving, you black sinners! And pray God you escape hellfire yourselves! <laughs> In The Ebb Tide, by Robert Louis Stevenson, the narrator was David Tennant, Captain Davis, Stanley Townsend, Herrick, Rupert Evans, Hewish, Charles Davis, and Atwater, Nick Sampson. The Ebb Tide was dramatised for radio by Jane Rogers and was produced and directed by Clive Brill. It was a Brill production for BBC Radio 4.